Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Schnellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we have talked about the autonomic nervous system. Today, it's time to talk about the structure of the nerves. It's nerve physiology, baby. Please watch these videos in order. Let me answer the question of the previous video. Most neurons are excited due to sodium influx, except what kind of neurons which are excited due to potassium influx. These are the nerve cells inside your inner ear. Cells of the nervous system are divided into neurons and glial cells or neuroglial cells. What does glia mean? It means glue. They are wrapping themselves around the neurons. They are helping the neurons. So think of this as neurons and co-neurons. The most important distinction between the two is that this is an excitable tissue. It gets action potential, depolarization, repolarization, etc. But these are not like that. What are the glial cells that you know in the central nervous system? I know the ependymal cells, microglial cells, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. Function of the ependymal cells, they line the choroid plexus and secrete the cerebrospinal fluid. Microglia is the macrophage of your central nervous system. We call them monocytes in the blood. We call them macrophage in the tissue. We call them cup fur cells in the liver. And we call them microglial cells in your central nervous system, such as in your brain. Oligodendrocytes, they make the myelin for the central nervous system fibers. And astrocytes contribute to the blood-brain barrier. In the peripheral nervous system, you have Schwann cells and satellite cells. A tumor made of neurons is called neuroma. A tumor made of glial cells is called glioma. How do I know which is which? Look at the intermediate filaments. The intermediate filaments inside neurons is called neurofilaments. But in glial cells it's called the GFAP, glial fibrillary acid protein. And I have a video on intermediate filaments on my channel. Now let's add an osis to neurons, it becomes neurosis. If you open an old psychology textbook, there was a huge comparison between psychosis and neurosis. No one uses this distinction anymore. Gliosis is a reaction of the glial cells. What are they reacting to? They are reacting to some kind of insult, injury, etc. And it is a very non-specific reaction. You can also say, oh, this is gliosis, therefore the diagnosis is, shut up. What's the structural unit of your central nervous system? Neurons. What's the functional unit? The reflex arc. Let's talk about the neuron. The neuron has dendrites, a soma, axon, and an axon terminus. Let's talk about dendrites. They are branched and they increase the surface area. That's why we need many branches. And if you remember my discussion on the ganglion in my autonomic nervous system lectures, a ganglion is a collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system. Basically, they are butting heads against each other. What helps is that they have many dendrites to increase the surface area and therefore increase the reception. Of nerve signals you can receive more signals this way next the soma or the cell body this is the structure that has the cytoplasm the nucleus and inside the nucleus you have the nucleolus it's a processing center surrounded by cell membrane it contains nucleus cytoplasm and organelles some textbooks will refer to the soma as the perikaryon i love this name what does karyon mean nucleus that's why we do karyotyping for chromosomes what does peri mean around Oh, so it's the structure around the nucleus. That's the perikaryon. Next, we have the axon or the nerve fiber carries nerve signals in one direction from here to here, downwards until you reach the axon terminus. But what is retrograde axonal transport? This is retrograde, like we're going in the opposite direction. However, we're not transmitting nerve signals. We're transmitting some chemicals, some substances, so that they can reach the soma because it's the mastermind. Last, we have the axon terminus or the synaptic knot because it's in the synapse. You have presynaptic and then later you'll have postsynaptic. It contains the vesicles that contain neurotransmitters. And depending on where you're at, the neurotransmitter could be acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, etc. You have two types of conduction, orthodromic and antidromic. What does the word dromic mean? Conduction. What does ortho mean? Straight. Oh, straight from here to here. Yep, in one direction. What is anti? In the opposite direction. Anti means opposite. Droma means conduction. And that's why we have dromotropic when we talk about the conduction in the heart. When we say that something is positively uh, dromotropic, it means it's increasing the conduction in the heart. If something is negatively dromotropic, it's decreasing the conduction of the heart. Ortho means straight, and that's why we have orthostatic hypotension, which means you get hypotension when you are standing straight. Also, you have orthopnea. P-N-E-A means breathe. Ortho means straight, so you can only breathe when you are sitting up. 
But when you lay back down on the bed, you cannot breathe. That's orthopnea. Next, neurotropins. What does IN mean? A protein. Most of the time, not all the time. Can you think of an exception? Sure, heparin. Heparin is not a protein. Heparin is a glycosaminoglycan, and it ends in IN. What does neuro mean? Nerve, or relates to the nervous system. What does tropic or trophy means? It means nutritious, uh, promoting growth. Do you remember the trophoblast? Yeah, it was promoting growth. It gave rise to the placenta. So let's define neurotropins. They are proteins. Oh, you don't say. Imagine my shock. Secreted by the neuroglial cells. Okay, they are the co-neurons. They help the neurons. Of course, they will help them grow. And they are also secreted by the muscle cells or the myocytes. Function, um, growth and development, survival and regeneration. Fate. They will be internalized by the nerve terminus. So here are some neurotropins released by the neuroglial cells or the muscle cells. Look at this spindle action. And then I go inside the nerve terminus. I am being internalized. And then via retrograde axonal transport, I'm going upwards toward the soma. What are nissle bodies or nissle granules? They are granular, imagine the shock. Bodies found in neurons, okay. Where exactly in the neurons you find them in the dendrites? and in the cell body, but you do not find them in the axons or in the axon HELOC. What the flip is a nissle body? Basically a rough endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, you mean it has ribosomes? Yes, it has rosettes. And that's why in neuropathology, when we talk about brain tumors, everything is either rosette or pseudo-rosette. Because medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. How do you stain Nissle body? Uh, I will name it after the, the body, after Mr. Nissle. So, it's called the Nissle stain. What the flip is this? Aniline stain for the RNA grounds. Why do you need RNA? Because ribosomes and RNA, uh, they are the same thing. They are made of the same raw material. Does anyone remember the ribosomal RNA? Function. If I am here off in the plasmic reticulum, of course I'm gonna make proteins. Duh. Medicine is just so hard and it doesn't make sense. Oh, shut up. Go study calculus. Nervous system is central or peripheral? Central, just the brain and the spinal cord. Peripheral, anything coming out of the brain, cranial nerve, or out of the spinal cord, spinal nerve. A nerve is an axon or a group of axons in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, but there is no such thing as a nerve inside the brain. We do not call it nerve, we'll call it something else, we'll call it a tract. In the previous video, I gave you four nuggets of medicine. You wanna know why? Because you can't handle five. Okay, nugget number one. Why do we need action potential? Because everything in your body is an action potential. Life is action potential. It's when an action happens to the potential. Nugget number two, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. But how about the antidromic that you have just talked about five seconds ago? The antidromic is experimentally outside the body, but inside your body, they are only going this way. It's either my way or the highway. Nugget number three, the nerve impulse starts, not in the soma, stop it, stop it. It starts in the axon HELOC because the most excitable part of the axon. Nugget number four, during rest, aka resting membrane potential, you have that polarized state. What the flip does that mean? I mean the inside is more negative compared to the outside. I did not say that inside is only negative and outside is only positive. No, 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 no. Inside has negative and positive. It just happens that it has more negative than positive relative to the outside. Relative terms, not absolute terms. Incremental, not categorical. That was so profound. But during activation or reversal of polarization or depolarization, now we have the reverse. The inside is getting more positive and therefore the outside is getting more negative relative to the inside. Whenever sodium comes in, you're getting more active. Whenever chloride, the negative, comes in, you're becoming more inactive. When the potassium leaves, the positive is leaving. I'm becoming more negative on the inside, therefore I'm becoming more inactive or resting or repolarization or, if I take it too far, hyperpolarization. Let's talk about myelin, shall we? Sure, myelin is mostly fat, and that's why it appears white. And 25% protein, because any active thing in your body gotta be have some protein in it. Function, it's an insulator. Okay, and it's interrupted here at the nodes of Ronvier. So basically the nerve impulse is going to jump. So whenever you have an insulator, myelin, this area is not gonna have any electricity. But in between where I have the interruptions, yes, we'll have electric impulses, and this is the action potential. Who makes the myelin? Well, it depends on where you live. If you live in the central nervous system, you can thank the oligodendrocytes. If you reside in the peripheral nervous system, you can thank your Schwann cells.
Do all nerves have myelin? The answer is no. Some of them are myelinated, some are unmyelinated. Okay, another question. Do all peripheral nerves have Schwann cells? The answer is yes, all of them have Schwann cells. However, in some cases, the Schwann cells are active, giving you some myelin, and sometimes they are not inactive, and you will end up remaining unmyelinated. Question number three. Do all neurons have a neurolemmal sheath? Absolutely freaking lothy. It's gonna be very important in the valerian degeneration. White matter versus gray matter. Okay, myelin is fat, it appears white. Therefore, this white area here is what? This is myelinated, but the gray area is unmyelinated. Conversely, the brain is the opposite, okay? The unmyelinated is on the outside, the myelinated is in the inside. You want some quick tip? Remember multiple sclerosis? Yeah, it was an autoimmune inflammatory demyelination of the central nervous system. What do you mean by demyelination? I'm losing my myelin. In the central nervous system, right? Yes. In the good old days, where was the myelin supposed to be inside your CNS? Oh, in the center, not on the periphery. Okay, so when you do an MRI on a patient with multiple sclerosis, where would you find the freaking bands or the freaking pathology in the center, not on the edges? You can call them oligoclonal band, remember the oligodendrocytes, huh? Or you can call them plaques, or you can call them anything. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Let's talk about the axon. I could be type A, type B, or type C. Type A is myelinated and thick. Type B is myelinated but thin. Type C is neither nor. It's neither thick nor myelinated. It's the worst of the worst. Look at the speed of transmission. Oh, just one meter per second. But look at the A, 100. Here is type A, thick and has myelin around it. How about type B, thin? has also myelin about it. around unmyelinated it is thin and there is no myelin whatsoever now when you inject local anesthetic which kind of nerve fiber is going to be affected first of course the thinnest local anesthetic agent will just diffuse it's easier to diffuse through this one and compared to this one this one's going to take more time which is a very fortunate situation because your dentist can just give you a local anesthetic and the pain will disappear first. You will still be able to move your cheeks and open your mouth. However, you will not feel any pain because the C fibers are affected first. And you can see it when you go to the dentist. The, the dentist just gives you a local anesthetic and then rubs your cheek for like 10 seconds, gives you 10 minutes to rest and boom, the pain is gone. But when the dentist asks you to open your mouth, you are still capable of doing it because your A fibers are fine. Did anyone notice that the dentist always asks you a question when your mouth is wide open and there are instruments inside of it? Oh, hey, uh, young man, what do you do for a living? Oh, 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 oh. What? Say what? Axons are type A, type B, or type C. Let's talk about the caliber. Thickest, thin, thinnest. The diameter, can you give me some numbers? Sure, 10, five, less than one. Micron or micrometer. The conduction velocity, of course, I'm thick and moderate. I am the super fastest, so 100. How about this one? 10 and one. 100, 10, one. I love it. 10, five, one, 100, 10, one. Next, the spike duration. When we talk about the action potential, I'll tell you that it has depolarization, upward spike, and then the downward going like this, repolarization. Perfect, okay. Which one is gonna go up fastest? Of course, type A. Look at this, look at this, 0.5 milliseconds. This is super fast. But look at here, just one, and it's getting worse, two. Can you give me an example of a type A fiber? Sure, the myelinated somatic fibers, and then we subdivide them into four groups, A alpha, A beta, A gamma, A delta. How about type B, myelinated preganglionic autonomic fibers, and type C, unmyelinated postganglionic autonomic fibers. If you wanna know why these are myelinated, but the postganglionics are not, please watch my autonomic physiology lectures. They were epic. Nugget number six, what are the factors that make me the most vulnerable to hypoxia? Well, here's the rule. You will be affected by hypoxia the most if you are either very active or far away from the artery or both. Example, type A is the most affected by hypoxia. Why is this? Because it's so thick. And as you know, blood supply comes from outside through the vasa nervosa. Oh, therefore, I'm gonna be so vulnerable to hypoxia, it's gonna be unbelievable. Moreover, type A is very metabolically active with all the stinking myelin surrounding it. So type A is the most vulnerable to hypoxia, followed by type B, followed by type C. If your textbook says otherwise, 
then it's a woke textbook. Let's talk about the kidney. Which cells are affected by hypoxia first or the most? The proximal convoluted tibial, especially the straight segment, and the thick ascending limb of loop of Henley. Why? They are very active. How about the liver? Zone 3. Why is this? It's the farthest away from the artery. The hepatic artery is in zone 1. Zone 3 is far, far away from the artery. How about the brain? Neurons. Not, why not the neuroglia? Because neurons are more metabolically active especially at the watershed areas when you have severe hypotension. What are the watershed areas? Areas farthest away from the big artery. So these are areas between the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery, or areas between the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery, or areas between the ACA and the PCA. Because at these areas, your arteries are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, less and less and less of oxygen. When you have severe hypotension, you're toast. How about the heart? Well, blood comes from the outside, thank you, coronary arteries. Therefore, the subendocardium, the far away that's on the inside, far away from the artery of the left ventricle, is the most vulnerable to hypoxia. How about the colon? The splenic flexure and the recto sigmoid junction. Why is this? Because the artery that supplies this part is different from the artery that supplies that part. Duh! This is mid-gut, this is hindgut. Get your head out of your sphincter. Types of neurons. You have multipolar, bipolar, and pseudo-unipolar. How do I know? Easy. Look at the soma, okay? And ask yourself, how many branches are coming out of the soma? Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You even count this one, so it's multiple. How about this one? One is here, one is here, that's bipolar. How about this? Just one. But it's as if it is two, so it's a pseudo-unipolar. Embryologically speaking, the nervous system originates from the ectoderm. Please watch my video called Neurulation. Types of tissues. Of course, you know that you have a cell and then a group of cells will make a tissue and then a group of tissues give you an organ system, etc. Types of tissue you have four. Epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nerve tissue. Let's talk about the nerve and the connective tissue. Wow, look at this beautiful picture. Here's the nerve. Each one of these is a nerve fiber. Okay. And then the connective tissue, of course, is going to provide support. So you have fiber fatty tissue. This is connective. You have endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. Endo means on the inside, so it's just wrapping around a single axon. How about the perineurium around like a bundle? And then the epineurium around the entire thing. Let's talk about the action potential in one minute and we'll get more details later. During rest, the inside is negative. Thank you so much. Why is this? Because potassium is leaving. All right, perfect. During activation or depolarization, the positive is coming in. Okay, so we're becoming more positive. Great. Next, let's go back to resting. All right, so potassium will keep leaving. Okay. But what if we went too far? Oh, negative 80 instead of negative 70. Oh, yeah, this is going too far. Then potassium is going to come inside again to bring it to negative 70. And that's why we call these channels inward rectifier potassium channel because they are pointing inwards, potassium is coming in. Rectifier, they are rectifying the overshooting that you did. Potassium channels. What is excitability? It's the ability of living tissue to respond to stimuli. Okay, can you give me an example of excitable tissues? Sure, nerves and muscles. Okay, what's the stimulus? A sudden change in the environment which excites the living organism. That's a good way of putting it. Types of stimuli, electrical, who cares? It's time for a medicosis clinical tie. Let me give you a review of anesthetics. Anesthetics are divided into two big groups, general anesthetics and local anesthetics. Based on what, first of all, these will make you lose consciousness, but these will not. Moreover, the mechanism is different. General anesthetics work by stimulating GABA, and GABA is inhibitory. This inhibits your nervous system, and you will be gone. Local anesthetics, however, are local. They just go to the local neuron. Hey, 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 can you please stop the sodium influx? Sure. Can you please stop the depolarization? Of course. Either way, you'll end up with inhibition. Local anesthetics mechanism of action. They inhibit the voltage-gated sodium channels, leading to inhibition of conduction of action potential via inhibiting the depolarization. Three steps, this is how they work. First, they cross the cell membrane. Okay, but the cell membrane is made of lipid. Okay, therefore I have to be lipid soluble in order to pass through lipid. That makes perfect sense. These local anesthetics are weak bases. They are alkali. Therefore what? They require an alkaline medium in order to be unionized. In other words, lipid soluble. Okay, what's the normal pH in your body? 7.4, bingo! This is an alkaline pH. And I am alkaline. Alkaline in an alkaline equals beautiful lipid-soluble thing that's gonna 
pass through the lipid soluble membrane. Okay, now I'm inside the neuron. What should I do? You should bind the sodium channel and inhibit it. As you know, opposites attract, similars repel. Look at this, this is positive, right? And therefore the cationic drug is the active drug. I will bind the stinking sodium channel. I will stabilize it in the inactive state. Stay closed, please. All right, I will not open. Therefore, sodium will not come in. Sodium will not be able to come in into the nerve fiber in your cheek for the dentist, in the nerve fiber in your hand for the whatever cosmetic surgeon, and nerve fibers or modified muscle cells in your heart for the freaking cardiologist. And that's why lidocaine is a local anesthetic. It's also class 1B antiarrhythmic drug. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. We divide local anesthetics into two groups, esters and amides. Esters, they are x cane. What do you mean? Uh, like uh, like any any word followed by cane, procaine, cocaine, tetracaine. Oh, cane is the suffix. Amides, on the other hand, you have an X, an I, X, and cane. So that's the prefix, these two are the root, and that's the suffix. Example, pre-locane, lidocaine, pubivacaine. Esters are plasma esterases. They are characterized by genotypic polymorphism, and they can give you a hypersensitivity reaction. Amides, on the other hand, they require the liver enzymes, such as the P450 system, and therefore, maybe, if you have liver disease and your liver is toast, you don't have enough enzymes, amides might be toxic to you. Let's review local anesthetics from Picmonic. All right, local anesthetic, here is a local nest. Oh, look at these local injections. All right, uh, they are for minor procedures and epidurals. Look at that epidural right here. Yeah, to keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5. How do they work? They block the sodium channel, blocking the salt. You can combine them with vasoconstrictors. And if the tissue is infected, it's gonna require a higher dose. And we have two groups, esters, the Easter bunny, and amides, here's the king amidus. Side effects, of course, if I block your sodium channels, I can get arrhythmia, yep, abnormal rhythm of the heart, or cardiotoxicity. What are the factors that affect the effectiveness of the electrical stimulus? Three factors. The rate of rise of the intensity. Boom! Okay, if it's rapid rise, you get a great response. But if it's a slow rise, oh, actually you get no response. Your nerve is gonna get used to it, called accommodation. This is the old adage of how to boil a frog. You raise the temperature slowly, gradually, and the frog will not feel it. Number two, strength. Number three, duration. Combine these two together and you have a beautiful strength duration curve, which we'll discuss in the next video. Question of the day. Which type of nerve fiber is the most affected by pressure? Is it type A, type B, or type C? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You will find the correct answer in the next video. If you want to learn more about general anesthetics, local anesthetics, opiates, stimulants, sedatives, hypnotics, anti-Parkinson's, anti-psychotics, antidepressants, and anti-epileptic medications, check out my CNS pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionatis.com. You can also download my antibiotics course and learn about antibacterials, anti virals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. And you can get a 25% discount towards anything on my website. Just use discount code SAVE25. It's available for a limited time only. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for more than 1,400 animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.